Assalamu alaikum students welcome back to class these are the final lectures for your ENG 503 prose 2 module um, just to take you back a little on what we have uh, done so far in this subject we started off with a travelogue by um, Jonathan Swift and um, we did one voyage that is the voyage to Lilliput and um, what we're going to do now and what we've been doing these last uh, few months is uh, short stories and uh, as I told you in the introduction to the short story we're going to be doing a number of short story writers for the last few classes we have been doing different stories by Anton Chekhov the Russian uh, writer and um, in this lecture and in the next one I'm going to give you a few more of uh, the short stories we've done short stories by Mark Twain we've done H.G. Wells um, and um, so you have a very good sort of cross-section of different styles the Chekhovian style is one of the two styles that still predominate as far as short story writing is concerned and that is why you have um, such a large chunk of your short story portion uh, reserved for um, short stories by Anton Chekhov we've done a couple of them and um, you will have noticed that uh, Chekhov like the other short story writers that I introduced to you um, keeps on looking around him and trying to find subjects which would be of interest to the common reader now with the short story um, the, the one big plus point um, is that it's a narrative that is read in one sitting so some of the short stories are really short like you know you, they would be about two to three pages and then there are some long ones which would go on to less something like let's say 20 pages um, and so um, there is no prescribed length for a short story but um, what is expected is that when a short story is written uh, what will be kept in mind is that it should not turn into a novella or um, or something that cannot be read uh, in one sitting uh, the best thing about the short story is that um, it tells you of an event or um, an incident that is complete in itself it gives the background but it is not so detailed that it would take a reader a lot of time to read through it so um, the, the short story that we're going to be to doing today is labeled an artist story and those of you who are interested in the fine arts or in the performance arts will be particularly um, uh, enjoying this story because it tells you about an artist uh, who is taking a vacation and what happens on that vacation and how he deals with that situation is what you'll find out in this um, short story written by Anton Chekhov so let us uh, go into the text and see uh, what Chekhov uh, has to tell us uh, about an artist's story it was six or seven years ago when I was living in one of the districts of the province of T now he will not give you the name because um, a lot of his readers would be familiar with the landscape of his writings and so to give away the, the name of the province would perhaps give away the names or identities of the characters who are um, who, who serve as as models for uh, the short story so he says this happened the, the incident that I'm referring to happened six or seven years ago uh, and that was the time that he was um, living with somebody else that is a young landowner called Bailokurov 
So, uh, Bailokhorov is the landowner and um, the writer or the narrator is um, the uh, is the person who is a tenant at his estate. But you see um, the the situation as it unfolds itself. So he says, uh, describing Bailokhorov, he says um, that. Um, the landowner used to get up very early, wear a peasant tunic, drink beer in the evenings and continually complain to me that he never met with sympathy from anyone. Now within these um, few lines, Chekhov has summed up the character, temperament and routine of uh, the young landowner and um, it's it's a very powerful image that is conveyed it's a very clear picture of uh, the young landowner because he he doesn't dress like a landowner he doesn't dress like the aristocracy he dresses like an ordinary person as he says he wears a peasant tunic not the kind of thing that you would find anyone in the aristocracy wearing but that is how uh, Bailakurov dresses up. So absolutely no pretension, no artificiality in him. Uh, except for the fact that he was always complaining to the narrator how no one sympathizes with, situ with his situation and everyone thinks that um, he needs to do more. Now the strange thing is, as Chekhov tells us in this slide, he lived in the lodge in the garden and I in the old seigneurial house. So the master, the landowner lives in this small hut-like building on the estate. But the real house that belonged to his ancestors is the one that is occupied by the narrator or the writer. So he's done something very smart and that is that he doesn't need a big house. So he lives in the small house, the lodge, uh, but um, he gives out the, uh, the, the larger house on rent. So the narrator lived in the big old um, seigneurial house and um, he then gives a descriptive um, image of the house. He talks about um, the furniture or the lack of it. He um, tells us how uh, there was hardly anything to, um, to, to sit on. Uh, and of course there was always, he says, a droning noise in the old Amos stoves. So there are certain things that are peculiar about um, this house and one of the things is this old stove that they have and which is kept burning all the time. In thunderstorms the whole house shook and seemed to be cracking into pieces. And it was rather terrifying especially at night when all the ten big windows were suddenly lit up by lightning. So a kind of scary atmosphere is what is being presented here. Mystery and suspense combined. Condemned by destiny to perpetual idleness, I did absolutely nothing. For hours together I gazed out of window at the sky, at the birds, at the avenue, read everything that was brought to me by post and slept. Sometimes I went out of the house and wandered about till late in the evening. So the artist is on holiday, the artist is relaxing, he's not, um, he, he's, he's not here to work, he's just here to spend a comfortable time and that is what he's doing. So he lies all day and he looks outside the window, he looks at the sun, he looks at the moon and so a life of infinite leisure, no end to it. Um, so he says that for hours together I would look out, out at the window, I would see uh, the birds flying, I would see 
um, for example, clouds sailing by, anything and everything that could be seen out of the window, this writer does. But uh, aside from the window, he doesn't want to get involved in anything, so he does not um, observe, uh, let's say, with the help of someone else. He, uh, he, he, he plans to um, do everything himself, and so he says he reads everything. You know, even junk mail that is brought to you by post, he would read that because he had no work. He had nothing to do and he did not know anyone in this area. And he says, sometimes I just went out of the house and I wandered around trying to see um, what was there and trying to see where I was. One day as I was returning home, I accidentally strayed into a place I did not know. So this is where he comes to the crux of the story and you see how fast he does it. In a couple of slides, we have reached the crux of the story. So he's, uh, he says, I accidentally strayed into uh, a place that I knew nothing about. Um, the sun was already sinking and the shades of evening lay across the flowering rye. Two rows of old, closely planted, very tall fir trees stood like two dense walls forming a picturesque gloomy avenue. You know an avenue has trees meet on both sides and sometimes the trees meet at the top and that makes a kind of bower. It's like a garden um, that, is, that is made. So um, he says that um, there were these tall fir trees that, um, that, that surrounded the place and that gave me a good feeling. I easily climbed over the fence and walked along the avenue, slipping over the fir needles which lay two inches deep on the ground. So um, he sees that there is a fence and without looking for the gate, without trying to see whether the gate is open or not, he just climbs over the fence and um, takes a walk um, down the avenue. It was still and dark, so um, a sort of mystery being um, created. There was a strong, almost stifling smell of raisin. Then I turned into a long avenue of limes. Here too all was desolation and age, Last year's leaves rusted mournfully under my feet and in the twilight shadows lurked between the trees. So, um, you know, the, the atmosphere that is being created is one of not just mystery and um, suspense, but um, one that shows sorrow, depression. It's not a very cheerful uh, landscape. The fact that even the leaves that he sees are dead and they are just lining um, the pavement or lining the path that he undertakes. So th the overall feeling that you get is that there's nothing new here. Whatever you see is old. It's not just old but it's depressing also. So from the old orchard on the right came the faint reluctant note of the golden oriole. There's one faint note, very, very soft music that is produced by um, this bird that he calls the golden oriole. And the idea that Chekhov gives is that the bird must have been old also because the bird doesn't have um, a fresh and strong um, musical sound. It's a very soft sound, so you get the feeling that even the bird uh, is old. So he's walking down this avenue 
and um, there, there are lime trees lining uh, both sides of the avenue and then he comes upon a house that is a double story house and all of a sudden he sees this courtyard so he's gone by accident to this place he didn't know that this place uh, existed remember he's been lying in his room uh, looking out of the window uh, watching things happening in a state of nature but not really making an effort to go out and see if he had neighbors and if he wanted to communicate with them etc etc so all of a sudden he uh, chances upon this place and he, uh, was tr he, he, he tries to explore what there is. So he comes across um, this house. So he came across a large pond and um, he saw uh, a bunch of trees there. So basically what he's doing is he's describing um, the landscape. But what is important here is that the entire landscape appears to be uh, uninhabited, old and um, sad and depressing and um, then he has this feeling of something familiar happening but he cannot put his finger on it and at the white stone gates which led from the yard to the fields um, he says that he found two girls one was elder than um, the other and um, he says that um, the elder one did not take any notice of me whereas the younger one uh, seemed sort of happy you know and, 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 and surprised because they have not seen him before so when he passes by the elder girl does not pay any attention at all while the younger girl looks surprised and um, she says something in English and that's again um, something that um, he does not expect and uh, the feeling that he gets is that he has seen them before somewhere you know sometimes you get this feeling uh, of what is called deja vu something has happened before um, you're sitting there uh, talking with your friend or talking with somebody else and at once you get the feeling that you have been in this place you've done this very thing before also and it is said that it is perhaps in a previous life um, that you uh, did all that so anyway he says that these two familiar that these two faces looked very familiar to me and um, I did not say anything at that time I did not ask any questions but a few days later uh, when Bailakurov and I were walking near the house a carriage drove unexpectedly into the yard now they've no never seen um, anything like that uh, happening but um, this is what happens and when they see uh, who is in the carriage they find out that it is one of those girls the older one not the younger one but the older one and she had traveled all the way to um, the estate of Bailakurov because she wanted subscriptions uh, now what what subscription here means is help uh, a kind of uh, relief fund that she's setting up because um, some of the houses owned by the poor villages had been burnt down you know they, they can't even call be called houses they are they're more cottages and um, she speaks with a lot of earnestness she's very precise very concise about um, the ideas that she wants to convey and so she tells us how many or uh, how many houses in the village of Sianofo uh, had been burned how many men women and children had been left homeless and um, what the relief committee of which she was a member planned to do so she's out on a kind of uh, publicity campaign 
and uh, she does not let any opportunity goes, go by without taking full advantage of it. So um, once, the, uh, one, once the, the lady had given us the form for um, the subscriptions, uh, and once she, uh, she, she had those signatures, she did not stay long and she quickly left. Uh, but she just mentioned as she was uh, leaving that Bailakurov had forgotten them. That is uh, a reference to the fact that Bailakurov um, has not been visiting them or has not had any uh, communication um, with these two girls. Do come and if Monsieur N cares to make the, uh, the acquaintance of admirers of his work and will come and see us, mother and I will be obliged. So she introduces her mother in this uh, uh, paragraph and she says that uh, if you want to bring the narrator along, um, that's fine with us, uh, but my mother would really like to see you. So the narrator of course is pleased, he bows his head and says, okay, I will come. And when the woman had gone, Pyotr Petrovich tr uh, started to tell me about her. The girl, he said, was of good family and her name was Lydia Volchaninov. Lydia Volchaninov. So she had family, she had estate, um, she, um, she, she came from a very good uh, family and uh, she lived on the other side of the pond in a place called Shelkovka. Shelkovka is the place where um, this individual lives. Um, her father had once been an important member of um, the um, of 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 the the, the government um, cabinet, the government setup, uh, and he had when when he died, he was a privy councillor, and the privy councillor is a very sort of exalted position. It's a very very VVIP uh, position. Uh, and what the narrator notes is that although the Volchaninovs had a huge estate, they had a lot of money, yet they preferred to live in the same place summer or winter. Now this is an, a very um, ordinary sentence, but what it conveys to us is that um, Russian families of good background having money did not stay in the same place throughout their lives. In winters, when it got to be very cold, they would go to a, to a place um, that had a warmer climate. And so um, this is like somebody from, let's say, um, Gilgit, Istor, coming down to Islamabad in the winters. And you know people who, who live in the northern areas of Pakistan and people who live in places where there's a lot of snow, generally for the winter season they migrate to places where there is either less snow or um, you, they, they are more easily accessible for transportation. So the Volchaninovs are special in the sense that although they have money, they have uh, a lot of property, yet they choose to live on this estate summer or winter and they do not go away to a warmer climate uh, for the winters. The elder girl is named Lydia and uh, she's called Lida. So uh, Lydia is a, t a teacher in the Zemstvo school in her own village. And uh, the salary that she received was 25 rubles a month. 
She spent nothing on herself but her salary and was very proud of earning her own living. So she's a school teacher. She is very much a modern woman. Um, she's very much a woman who has her own opinions, who has her own views, and she tells everyone what her views and her opinions are. She doesn't sit quietly at all. Um, so she's a teacher, and as teacher, she wants to make her views known to everyone. And she's spending nothing on herself. That is, uh, only the salary that she's getting, she spends on herself. Uh, the rest of the estate um, is, is not something that she brings to her personal use. So Bailikurov says that it's an interesting family. Let's go over one day and I'm sure that they will be happy to see you. So Bailikurov is using the narrator as a kind of front man, as the person who um, who's going to provide him with an excuse um, to go into um, the house. So one afternoon on a holiday, they both plan to go to the, uh, uh, to the Volchaninovs in the Shelkovka. Now, they make this program and they find the mother and two daughters at home. The two daughters um, you have met previously um, in the same lecture and then there is uh, the mother also. The mother figure is always there um, in the background. And she's in the background because the elder daughter is so much in the foreground. She's their center stage. She's where all the light is focused on her and the mother uh, sort of recedes into the background. So when um, Chekhov is describing the mother, he says that she was old, she was depressed, vague, she had become very weak. But she had seen a couple of my paintings and she recalled those paintings uh, and um, she asked me what I had meant to express. Now this is something that artists and particularly painters um, very frequently uh, are asked to do and maybe you've seen at exhibitions also where you go when the artist is there and she or he will try to tell you what she or he has tried to portray or, or exhibit or, or show. Um, and so the artist or the narrator um, is asked by Katrina Pavlovna uh, what exactly he meant in those uh, paintings. So she had an interest and uh, she wanted to know, but uh, Lida did not talk to him. From the very beginning, you see that there's a kind of, um, it's not exactly a generation gap, but a kind of communication gap between Lida and um, the artist narrator. And this gap, or this lack of communication uh, is never healed. This gap is never bridged. So although uh, the mother tries to take an interest in whatever um, the artist is saying, um, Lida does not. She, she, she asks him why he's not on um, the, um, the, the school council, the Zemstvo as he, um, she calls it. Uh, and um, the artist has no, no, no reason. Um, he's not attended any meetings of the council. He's never gone to the school. Uh, he just is not interested in uh, anything like that. And, uh, and so Lida is very vocal and she says, you know, this is, this is not the way you should go on. Um, and, 
this is where you find out that the mother uh, gives her assent to everything that the elder daughter says and that uh, that phrase is used again and again by um, Chekhov that is that's true Lida that's true it isn't right so whatever Lida says her mother sort of echoes her so if um, if she says something is bad the mother will say yes it is bad if she says that something is really wonderful then you will find the mother also um, sort of um, joining in so Lira goes on and she says our whole district is in the hand of um, the Balajin he is the chairman of the Zemstovo board and he has um, distributed all the posts in the district among his nephews and sons-in-law and he does as he likes he ought to be opposed so um, Lida is trying to set up a kind of um, revolutionary force which would throw uh, Belagin out of um, the region out of the district and um, it would be um, it, it would be up to um, to Lida to try to get the artist narrator to take an interest. Lida serves on, in the Zemstvo school. According to her, the artist narrator should also take an interest in. Um, the school and be told that these are things that he can do and these are things that he must not do. Now this is a very strange um, situation but you see Lida wanting the young men to make a party so that they can uh, promote her causes uh, or um, we can give exposure to um, to something that she has uh, an interest in so um, she she attacks young men in general but her uh, her immediate um, aim is to hit out at um, Pyotr Petrovich now the younger sister Genia is silent most of the time she takes no part in the serious conversa conversation. She's always there. She somehow she's treated as the baby of um, the family still, although she's not a baby anymore. And uh, and and one um, evidence that you have of um, um, of her being treated as a child is the fact that she is still given the nickname of misuse because that's what she had called her English governor when she was a child so Genia uh, the one who is called misuse l gives very um, strange looks to the artist narrator she, she has a lot of curiosity uh, but she doesn't ask many questions she shows uh, him the photograph album the family photograph album and um, her manner at all times is that of a child um, the the artist narrator looks at her as a young woman but what you see in the descriptions that Chekhov give, gives us is that she's not been allowed to develop according to her age she's been treated as a child um, and a child she has remained she has not really uh, grown up or uh, matured so her physical uh, appearance is also that of a child she's thin she appears to be uh, undernourished uh, not at all like uh, Lida or like uh, her mother and then she's interested in sports so um, the artist narrator 
uh, plays croquet, he plays lawn tennis, he, they, they take walks. So they become good friends. Uh, but all along you notice that Kenya or uh, Misuse, um, as uh, she's called, starts to take a lot of interest uh, in the artist narrator. Um, from his point of view, the, um, the artist narrator feels comfortable in this house. Um, so he starts um, to come uh, very regularly. Uh, but what he does not uh, like or what he doesn't appreciate is the fact that Lida has a one-track mind. She's talking about the school board all the time and she does not have any other topic of interest for her. Um, all uh, all the young people should be working for the school board. Um, she was energetic, she was genuine, she had convictions and it was interesting to listen to her but uh, she had such a loud voice and you know she was very f fond of the sound of her own voice because she talked all the time. Uh, on the other hand, Pyotr Petrovich, who had retained from his student days the habit of turning every conversation into an argument, was tedious, flat, long-winded, and unmistakably anxious to appear clever and um, advanced. So, uh, Bailakurov is not the kind of person who uh, who would ever be truly uh, appreciated because he's clumsy, he, um, he tries his best but he never quite uh, makes that mark, etc, etc. So when they go home, Bailakurov says, good breeding is shown not by upsetting the sauce but by not noticing it when somebody else does so. He's being scornful, he's being sarcastic. Um, the artist narrator has pointed out, look at what you've done, you know, you've, you've spilled the sauce. And he says that good breeding um, is shown when you do not make a reference. Civilization is not exposing uh, other people's uh, faults, trying to cover them up um, a little. So Balakarov says that, you know, it's, it's strange that I have, uh, I have lost touch with my neighbors, with my friends, uh, because of uh, a certain job. But he says, that um, I have, um, I've not really tried to go back to work. So he, he, he talks of how, how hard one has to work if one wants to be a model farmer. And um, he makes the, the artist narrator think that here is this person who does not do anything at all and who doesn't even want to make an attempt. So, uh, and you could see that when he was talking uh, about something um, in a very, uh, <clears throat> let's say, earnest manner, he would start off with, uh, mm, you know, th that sort of uh, expressions and uh, gestures. So, he um, he didn't really believe that he could be successful in business, um, and um, the the artist narrator makes a very interesting observation here. He says, "I gave him some letters to post, and he just carried them about in his coat pocket, and he forgot to post them because that is that was not uh, one of his uh, priorities." So after weeks. He discovered those letters still in his coat pocket and that is how and when um, he actually posted them. And one thing that you notice um, throughout this story in as far as Bailakurov is concerned 
is the fact that he is always complaining that he doesn't meet sympathy from anyone. So he's looking for sympathy, he doesn't get it, he doesn't get it from Lida, he doesn't get it from his mother, he doesn't get it uh, from the artist narrator. So um, he, he is basically complaining about not getting any sympathy at all. Now, when Bailakurov started tell, talking about these things, the artist narrator says that he started going to the house of the Volchaninovs very frequently. And he had this um, sort of set pattern um, when he went to their house. And that is, he would sit on the lower step of the terrace because he was uh, dissatisfied. He, uh, he thought of life uh, passing him by. Um, he thought of um, children. He thought of so many different things. Uh, but above all, uh, Chekhov says that he was fretted by dissatisfaction with myself. Remember, he had been looking out of the window. He had just sort of, he had lain there or he had sat there and he didn't really want to do anything else. But all of a sudden, he comes across this house and more than the house, um, the two girls. And it's those two girls who make him feel welcome and um, who give him the, f the feeling of, um, of a family. So um, he, he, he strikes up this friendship with Genya, but what, whenever he tries to talk with Lida, he comes up against a blank wall because Lida has certain preconceived notions, she has certain ideas and um, she has a hobby horse and that is the Zemstavo school. So um, whoever she sees, whoever she meets, she tries to sell sort of um, the idea of, um, of, of that school to them. And what she emphasizes is that the poor people need help, um, those who are sick and ailing in hospitals, um, they need medication, and, um, and, and so on and so forth. But what the artist narrator says is that um, Lida would mention all these, and then at the end she'd say, oh, but that's not interesting for you, because she had a very... Um, strange opinion about um, his interests and uh, his intelligence. So she didn't like me, she disliked me because I was a landscape painter and she did not, and, um, did not portray um, pictures. And, uh, and then um, as she fancied I was indifferent to what she put such faith in. So all those uh, beliefs that she had, all those projects that she was working on, uh, gave her a different mindset. And the author narrators, the artist narrator says that um, I didn't want to have um, any part of it. I um, I remember when I was traveling on the lang on the banks of uh, of Lake Baikul. Uh, and I met a Buryat girl on horseback wearing a shirt and trousers of blue Chinese canvas. So um, th this is the incident that um, he tries to um, relate to Lida in order to bring him round to his point of view. See, it's, it's like a face-off, it's like a confrontation. Both have very fixed ideas and neither is um, willing to, to, to give in. So whenever uh, the artist talks about something artistic, something happening on the continent, Lida sort of negates um, that, that influence or that incident or that story. And once she has had her say, she would just leave. If she had come riding and she wanted to say something to you and you wanted to say something um, in return, what you'd get is 
a blank wall. She would say her part of it and then she would just disappear or if she is even in, in, in the same place, um, she would block her, um, her, her mind um, to everything else. She never outwardly dis uh, expressed dislike for me, but I felt it. So the artist narrator, being a very um, sort of sensitive person, can sense the dislike that Lida has uh, for him. She, he, he doesn't have any, um, any evidence that he can offer except for, um, as he says, little bits here and there where she would um, sort of, she would give pinpricks um, to the artist narrator. Now these two, they have different personalities. They don't actually clash, but they have differences of opinion. For example, Lida goes around giving uh, medicines to the patients. And the artist narrator believes that that should not be done because you might give a wrong medicine and uh, that would undo all the good work that she had ever done. Now, this is about Lida. Then Chekhov moves on to misuse um, or, um, or, or Genia as her real name is and he gives you a description of her. Now when he's having these sort of uh, arguments with Lida, Genia or Misuse is not upset at all. Lida is the one who dominates this household. Whatever she says, her sister and her mother agree with her. So in that sense of the word, um, it's, uh, it, she's the only one who can say anything or who can express an opinion in that family. Whatever she says, her mother says, that's right, that's true. Uh, people should understand your point of view. And the same is true of Genya. Genya does not have a mind of her own. She admires Lida uh, and she... Uh, she obeys her without any um, second thoughts at all. So Genya was a different person. When she got up in the morning, she would take a book, she would sit on the terrace and, um, and she'd be lost in the world of uh, her, her, her book. So she was basically um, a reader. And... Um, and, and Chekhov says that it's only from the paleness of her face that one could make out that, you know, she's cooped up inside the house all the time, she's concentrating, she's focused on her book, and she doesn't look at uh, what is around her, or she, she doesn't take any interest in her um, environment. So when he, fir when, when he first started um, to visit the house, she, um, she would change color. She was a little embarrassed. She was shy. And uh, she'd leave her book because it's discourteous to be reading when somebody else is with you. And, um, and, and then she would be all ears and all eyes for whatever um, he had to say. So Genya um, f f falls in love with the, the artist narrator. And this is basically um, a love story, but a love story with a difference. You might be able to find a lot of um, points of similarity with love stories that are popular in our part of the world. But you'll have to see how um, this all ends. And um, Chekhov gives a very detailed description of this girl. You know, he's, he's focused on this girl. He's concentrating on her. So he notices everything. He notices the time she gets up. He notices what she's wearing how frequently she's wearing it. So, um, and, and he says that, you know, uh, most of the time she was dressed in the same clothes. 
but she, with the passage of time, she, be, she started feeling more comfortable um, in his uh, presence. And then um, she would go out for a walk with the artist narrator and um, slowly and gradually uh, this relationship develops. Whenever the artist narrator um, paints, she stands by his side and um, she sort of lends her support. But um, Chekhov says that one Sunday at the end of July, I came to the Volchaninovs about 9 o'clock in the morning. So early morning he would go there. Remember, he had no work that needed to be done. He was there on holiday. So uh, early in the morning he would go there and, uh, and, and walk around the place. So the, this, the house and its inmates seem to have um, a fascination for um, the artist um, narrator. This Sunday morning, um, when he goes there, he sees uh, Genya and her mother, and they are both uh, in their formal dresses because they're just coming back from uh, from the church. And then he hears them having tea, and um, you know, th this is the kind of thing that occupies his mind, that occupies his waking hours. And uh, what you need to focus on in this and the, la and the next couple of slides is the depth of detail that Chekhov gives about um, their dress, about what they do, uh, about how they do it, you know, um, the, these are things that he's focusing on. And um, he says that th th these descriptions are um, what makes um, Chekhov's short stories so interesting because there's a depth of detail uh, in these descriptions that you do not find in, uh, for example, other um, short story writers. So there's a lot that he gives us to you in um, the form of physical description, uh, in the form of, um, of giving a narrative that is also a descriptive um, narrative. So, um, you know, he, the, the artist spends his days like that, he goes nearly every morning to the Volchaninov's house. Um, he sits around, he sees what the sisters are doing, and he becomes a kind of a hanger-on without having any purpose at all in life. Remember, he's on holiday, the rest of the people are not. They're doing their work, but um, the, the artist narrator is uh, free to do what he wants to. So this particular Sunday morning, at the end of July, he sees Genya coming out with the basket, and um, the look that she had on her face showed that she was expecting the artist narrator um, to be there. So they go for a walk, they gather mushrooms, they talk, and whenever she asked him a question, she would look at his face to see what the answer is going to be. And she says, you know, a miracle happened in the village yesterday. There's this lame woman who had been ill for, um, for, for the whole of last year. And uh, a woman came and whispered something over her and her illness passed away. Now this is something that's very exciting uh, for somebody like Genya. But the artist narrator says that you, you're going to be disappointed because... Um, you know, you can't just expect miracles among sick people and old people. Um, you need to look around yourself and see what is miraculous um, and, um, and, and what, what, how is a miracle defined. And he gives a very simple definition and he says that whatever is beyond our understanding is a miracle. Now this is where he presents an idea um, that may appear strange to us, but which is actually quite true, because when we say that it is a miracle, it's not that 
something really wonderful or really rather extraordinary has happened. It is that for us it's something new. For us it has a certain um, significance. So they get into this discussion on what is miracle and the phenomena and the different phenomena of nature um, that, um, that, that is exhibited and they have this um, very sort of uh, lively discussion. Now Genya you see is very impressed by the artist narrator. She's impressed and she she almost hangs on his every word. Whatever he says, she believes in. And she thinks that because he's an artist, he knows a great deal more. He's closer to the eternal being than she can ever be. So she talks to him. She discusses these things with him. And she makes him feel very comfortable. Now what you see here is on the one hand, you have Lida, who, um, who finds fault with everything that the artist narrator does, everything that the artist narrator says. And then you have Genya who's absolutely fascinated. And um, she believes everything um, that she's told. So you have these two um, very different women. And um, their, uh, th their opinions of the artist narrator are are totally different. Genya is very impressed, Lida is least impressed and therefore least bothered. Um, and, you s and yet you see that Lida has a sort of influence over um, her mother and her sister uh, that is very difficult for the artist narrator um, to counter. And it upsets Genya that Lida, whom she admires so much, and the artist narrator, whom again she admires and loves, should be arguing all the time. And he says, why do you always argue with her? Why are you irritated? And um, the artist narrator says, because she's wrong. Now that's something that is, um, that is just not uh, comprehended by Genya because for her um, Lida knows everything and whatever Lida is doing is wonderful. So she cannot find fault with Lida, she cannot find fault with the artist narrator but the problem is that Lida and the artist narrator do not see eye to eye with each other. Lida does a lot of good work but the artist narrator thinks that that good work um, is useless and there should be um, some other way of, um, of helping um, the people of um, the village. So uh, you know time passes and um, this the relationship with Genya develops, but the relationship with Lida uh, worsens with with each passing day, with each pa with each encounter um, that the artist narrator has um, has uh, with with her. So um, one day, you know, she um, the artist narrator um, comes to the house and he finds. Uh, the mother looking drowsy and uh, carrying a fan and and Genya who is devoted to her mother says mother you shouldn't be sleeping during the daytime now that shows you how much she cares for her mother and um, he um, uh, Chekhov when he is describing the relationship between the mother and the daughter he says that they, those two were so devoted to each other that uh, when one was out of sight of the other, um, she would call her. So if the mother disappeared for some time, Genya would call out to her and the same thing happened if Genya went off and uh, her mother was looking uh, for her. So, so Genya and her mother had a kind of rapport 
and um, and yet they were very impressed by whatever Lida said and whatever Lida was doing. So these two, they sort of um, are impressed not just by Lida but also by the artist narrator to the extent that the mother uh, copies her younger daughter Genia on misuse and whenever the painter or the artist uh, narrator is working she would come and she would stand by him and she would appreciate and admire whatever it was um, that he was making so it, it's a very strange situation because you have these two people who are very different in their approach towards life that is Lida and um, the artist narrator and yet you have the other two people in the story that is um, Genia and her mother they are impressed by both of them although they are their personalities their temperaments are uh, poles apart so um, highly impressed by both they have very um, sort of um, the, the mother and the daughter have the kind of temperament, the kind of nature that is very easily uh, impressed. You could say almost gullible um, and what they cannot sort of assimilate is why these two people that they admire cannot get along with each other. So th so th that is the sort of uh, point of contention. Anyway, so time passes and um, the relationship between Genya and the artist narrator develops until uh, the day arrives when um, the artist narrator feels that he needs to formalize this relationship. Now, uh, we're going to end this lesson here and um, the rest of the story I'm going to take on into the next lecture, which is going to be the last lecture. But before I uh, wind up, I want to quickly go through what we have done today. Um, this is uh, one of the longer short stories of uh, Anton Chekhov. And uh, in this story, he tells us about an artist who is taking a vacation. And uh, the situation that he um, describes is such that uh, Bailakurov, the landowner uh, who owns the estate, he shifts into the lodge or into the smaller house and he gives the larger house, the seigneurial house, to um, the artist narrator and uh, the artist narrator spends a sort of uh, spend days and weeks in uh, in idleness gazing out of the window uh, just lying in bed or lounging and then um, he starts taking walks and one of the one of uh, the days that he takes a walk he comes across um, this house where he sees these two young girls and uh, with the passage of time he starts um, visiting the, this house he develops a relationship with Genia the younger um, daughter um, as, uh, whereas um, Lida or Lydia um, as her uh, name should properly be is a very different kind of person so the kind of relationship that uh, the artist narrator develops with the younger daughter is, is one that is a very comfortable one. Um, and he slowly starts to fall in love with her. Uh, then he also feels very comfortable with the mother. So there are these three women um, in this house, the mother and the two daughters. Um, and as far as the mother is concerned, he's very comfortable, but um, as far as the elder daughter is concerned, uh, she is a kind of social worker and um, she teaches in um, the school in the village and she wants everyone to do that kind of thing. But 
the artist narrator has a very different temperament and um, they have these very frequent arguments about what the other should be doing. Lida thinks that the artist narrator is useless, is idle, is a parasite, whereas the artist narrator thinks that her her um, her total approach towards uh, the issue is faulty and that she needs to um, revise her thinking processes and her approach towards life. Now um, it, it's a strange situation because the mother is Im the mother and Genya are impressed not just by the author, the artist uh, narrator, but also by um, by Lida. And yet Lida and the artist narrator um, do not get along with each other. So the point at which I am going to leave you is where this relationship continues uh, to be one of sort of acrimony because whenever Lida and the artist narrator meet there's always some argument that crops up. And on the other hand the relationship between the artist narrator and Genya is one that deepens with the passage of time. And um, because the mother is like the younger daughter, um, so she also starts to spend a lot of her time with the artist narrator. So I'm going to leave you here and in the next lecture, inshallah, we're going to continue from here, complete uh, this story and maybe add another one. Thank you very much and Allah Hafiz.